Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this next session in the Charmed Forest Species ID and Recording Programme. Um, we're just on one o'clock, so I'm going to make a start. Um, hopefully, anybody who might be a few minutes late will join us without missing too much. Um, uh, it's great to have you all with us again. I can't believe it's been uh, four weeks since the last session, uh, but hopefully this will be a good one as well. Um, and it's all about species identification keys. Um, so just a reminder that we are recording this session so that we can um, get up on our YouTube channel afterwards for anyone who can't make it today. If you could please make sure your microphones are off unless you're asking a question. Um, you're welcome to have your videos on or off. Um, sometimes if you're struggling with bandwidth, turning your video off does help. There will be time for questions at the end. Um, do feel free to put things in the chat box, um, but just be aware that I can't always see those while we're going through the presentation, um, but we will have a run through of everything at the end. And hopefully we'll be finished uh, around two o'clock as we have done previously. So just a reminder that you can find out more about the scheme on our website, uh, and you can listen to the video from Julie Attard, the scheme manager, um, she'll give you a little bit more background if you want to know about any of the rest of the scheme, any of the other projects that are going on as well, um, recommend you checking in there. And just again a reminder as well about this element of the project. So we're part of the larger scheme here, uh, and this is the Identifying and Recording Species project. Um, we're hoping to help train up uh, new recorders and get new recorder groups set up so that we can in spe increase species records for Charmed Forest. Um, it's a really important management tool um, so that we can check on the health of habitats and species, find out more about what's going on. Hopefully it's fun to do, learning new skills, getting out and meeting new people and connecting with nature. Um, hopefully it's a really important um, part of the whole um, project, as hopefully you'll see. And today's session about using keys is really important because accuracy and reliability of records um, that get submitted is really important. Um, so both common and rare species, and that gives us a true picture of the state of the environment. So we want people to be confident that they're identifying the right species um, and that they're confident to pop those through to, to our records databases um, so that we know we're, um, we're accurate, we've got the right species represented. So hopefully this will give you a flavour of a way that you can increase your confidence um, in your identification if that's required in uh, a range of different species. So I'm going to move on towards um, the main part of the session today, which is all about species identification keys. Uh, and as it says here, a methodical approach to accurate identification. Um, so hopefully that's what we'll be taking you through. But what is an identification key and why do we use them? Well, I mentioned it's a more methodical approach, um, but if you're anything like me, it's like, oh, you flip past the key bit in the book to get to the pictures. Um, so hopefully this gives you an alternative option um, to flicking past all the words at the start and going straight to the pictures. And it will help you build confidence that you're certain in the identification of the specimen that you're actually looking at. So you can think of a key really as a method for identifying species through answering a series of questions. Uh, and that can be based on contrasting features or characteristics. Um, so step by step series of questions uh, and you can decide kind of which features you're looking at and you know, what's the right answer to that it takes you to the next stepping stone if you like. So a fixed sequence and multiple alternatives and each of them, the answer to each determines your next step until you reach the end of the key and hopefully the correct species. In some instances, you might have to go through two or three keys um, to get there and we'll show you some examples of that later on today. It is a more methodical and accurate alternative to looking through the pictures or just Googling it until you find an answer. So hopefully you'll kind of come to an understanding that it's worth the time and effort that it takes um, to have a go at this. Um, and hopefully you'll, you know, the outcome the, and the result of using a key is quite satisfying when you get there um, and just a really good way. Um, so just a really good skill to have when you're out and about identifying any species. You can use identification keys at a number of different levels. You can look at what plant you have, what species of plant is it, uh, and all the way down to is this a rare species when you're looking at the really fine detail, maybe under a hand lens or a microscope, because that's what it takes sometimes to differentiate um, different species. You really need to drill into the detail of different features and characteristics. So there's a number of different types of key that you might come across, uh, and we're gonna be going through these um, today uh, in general. We won't be going into huge detail um, with any kind of technical language. There may be some words that I use, oh, I'm not sure what that means. I won't necessarily break down absolutely every word 
that's maybe for a later date. Uh, but we'll be going through things like pictorial keys, we'll be talking about single and multi-access keys, dichotomous and polychotomous, I will explain what those two mean, keys within identification guidebooks, online and web-based keys as well. Um, there's more and more of those coming, um, coming to the front uh, and becoming available free of charge, which is brilliant. And you might use a key for a range of different species, pretty much anything you can think of, but plants is a big one, invertebrates, um, there's fungi, there's birds, there's lichens, um, different keys in books online. Um, and we'll go through some of those today. So I thought we'd start off just with a simple pictorial leaf key. So this is one of those, it's the pictorial, so that's the first one on the list. It's quite simple, uh, simple quite straightforward. Um, so um, as the, uh, as the, the big green kind of spiky bit suggests there, you start here in the green star there. Um, so it's a great kind of example of uh, a pictorial key um, where you've got a clear starting point uh, and it leads you through a bit of a flow chart. So it asks you a question, you decide yes or no, and it leads you through a flow chart and you end up at a leaf, which you can decide if that matches your specimen or not. So I thought we'd have a quick go. Um, I popped out um, earlier this week and picked up a leaf. Hopefully you can see that on the right there. Picked up a leaf. I thought we'd have a little go, um, see if we can work out what this tree is. So we, if we go to start here, we start with, is the leaf made up of many smaller leaves or leaflets? Yes or no. So quite straightforward, I think this one, it's, it's one single leaf, it doesn't have leaflets um, in any way, shape or form. So it's one leaf, so we can say no, move along to the right there to the next question. Is the leaf hand-shaped with five main fingers? Mm, no, I don't think so. I think that doesn't look hand-shaped to me. So we go down the line, across to the right again for no. Now the next question, does the leaf have toothed or wavy edges? It's a little bit wavy, but I don't think it's toothed. And so I think I'd probably err on the side of saying no to that as well. Uh, and then the no this time means you go follow the left hand arrow uh, and you come down to a beech leaf. Now, and if you compare that leaf with our specimen, you think actually that could well be a beech leaf. You might want to go away and do a little bit more research, look at a few more examples of leaves off the same tree, uh, make sure that that's, you know, you're confident in that. So within a few quite easy steps, you come up with what your leaf might be, what your tree might be. But to confuse things on my same walk, I picked a very similar looking leaf, um, but subtly different. And if we would take this through the leaf key, we'd actually take the same journey. It's not made up of many smaller leaves, not hand shaped with five fingers and it doesn't have toothed away the edges but this time it doesn't look like the only example that they give us there the beech leaf um, so this is where a very simple key will fall down this one only has nine common tree species it doesn't show them all we'll talk about some other limitations of keys as we go through but that's the first and most obvious if you key something out that's kind of the phrase that a lot of people use keying it out if you key something out and it doesn't come up with what you might expect on further investigation, um, there could be a number of reasons for that. But one of them might just be that the key isn't comprehensive enough and doesn't cover a full range of all the species that you might find wherever you happen to be. So worth bearing that in mind. So I promised you that we'd uh, go into some detail about some of the um, uh, more kind of the, the different terminology, the different types of key. Uh, and so the next ones we're going to look at are single access dichotomous keys. Sounds like a bit of a mouthful, um, but we'll break it down. Uh, and these are actually the keys you will come across most often if you've got uh, an identification guidebook. So the single access part of this just means it's got a clear single starting point. Um, you may be number one, it might be A, it might be just the top of the paragraph. And it's often set out with consecutive pairs of numbered questions or statements. Sometimes these are also known as indented keys, and I'll show you some examples of those later on. The dichotomous part just means that the series of statements it has, each of which has only two mutually exclusive alternative answers or outcomes. So it's an either or. You're either selecting the first one or the second one, uh, and there's only two. So for example, um, we've got a pair of statements here. One says specimen has less than six legs. One A says that specimen has six or more legs. Hopefully you can understand that a specimen will fit into one of those. It may have no legs at all, therefore that would be less than six. It may have a hundred legs and that would fit in the six or more category. So for example, our photo on the right here, this specimen has an awful lot of legs, almost too many to count. So we'd go with one A, specimen has six or more legs. We'd follow along to the right hand end of that sentence and you'd see that there's a number three 
So in this instance, we'd go to question number three as our next step. If we had a specimen that had less than six legs, we would go to number two as our next step. So it's fairly straightforward when they're paired up like this with kind of just two options um, and a number at the end of each option. It's quite a straightforward way to go through to the next step. So depending on what you answer, you'll be taken down a bit of a different pathway. So a bit of a detective kind of mystery almost. You get more of these either or questions until you arrive at your identification. If you hear a polycotonous key, um, we'll see some of those and some of kind of a bit of a combination of poly and dichotomous. It just means it might have more than two answer options. It still functions in the same way. So you might have three, four or five, but still mutually exclusive statements, only one of which will be true for your specimen. A little asterisk there is just a reminder to me to tell you that you might need to look over the page to find the paired option. Sometimes actually just finding what your two or three options are, um, you actually have to look um, on separate pages in your guide. And again, I'll show you some examples of those later on. So a simple dichotomous key for rushes. This is one I picked up when I did um, a rush course um, quite some time ago. Uh, and this is just a, a little example of uh, a really simple key that will give you um, five really common rush species. Um, so this doesn't go into detail about loads of different rushes. So if the one you've got doesn't match up with this, it could just be um, a less common species. But it's a great way to show you um, how you might get to a relatively common rush species. So you'd start at number one and you've got a pair of statements, both numbered one, and they say flower head on the side of the stem or flower head on the top of the stem. So if the flower head is on the side of the stem, you go to number two. If the flower head is on the top of the stem, you go to number four. So the image below, um, hopefully you can see that the stem goes up past the flowering part. Um, so I would say the flower head in this instance is on the side of the stem, so we'd go to number two. So um, statement two now says either the stem has distinct vertical grooves, and it says it felt with a finger, so that gives you a clue as to how you might work that out, or the stem is almost smooth, no vertical grooves felt with a finger. And from a photograph, it's quite tricky to see this, um, but hopefully um, you will take my word for it that this stem is smooth, I can't see any ridges, and I couldn't feel any ridges on it. So in this instance, stem is almost smooth would be the appropriate answer. And looking on the right there, we're fairly confident that we've got soft brush. If we'd taken a different path from the first one, maybe the flower head was on the top of the stem, we'd have gone to number four and we'd have had to look at the tepals and the sepals uh, and the fruits. If we'd have taken the, um, if we'd have found the grooves, we'd have gone on to number three, the flower head uh, very dense or the flower head loose, and that would give us an idea of whether it was compact or hard brush. So it's quite straightforward. It's only for five species of rushes. Um, but it's a simple single access dichotomous key. So it's pairs of statements, it's either or, uh, and you start at the top and you work your way through. So hopefully that's quite um, straightforward uh, and a good example of a simple, uh, single access dichotomous key. Multi-access keys are a little bit more complicated. Mostly they're online uh, and we will go through a range of those uh, uh, later on. But the idea of a multi-access key is you don't have to start at the beginning, which is could be quite helpful. If you don't know the answer to or can't find the answer to that first question, um, then you're a bit stuck with a single access key. But a multiple access key uh, means that you can choose the characteristics that you do know. Um, you can sometimes skip characteristics that you don't know, and it will give you more of a probability um, of what your species might be, and that will help you narrow it down. So for example, this one on the right is from the Field Studies Council and it's the key to groups of British grasses. And you've got some characteristics that you can select or not. Inflorescence, spike foot arrangement, spike foot shape, blooms, floret number, horns, horn length and horn type. And hopefully you can see I've pre-populated some of them with things that I did know. So I knew the inflorescence was a panicle, spike foot was singly or in pairs. I wasn't sure about the spike foot shape, so I've just left that blank. I put in the information about blooms, wasn't sure about floret numbers, I identified horns, but I didn't have anything to measure the length of it, so I didn't put that in. Uh, and I could see that the horns were straight. So I've now got some characteristics that I was fairly confident in, uh, and I've left out the ones that I wasn't so confident in. And on the right hand side, it's given me a list of most and least likely species. So the most likely ones, the ones with more of the blue dots. So that's where, where the options I've selected are true for that species. The orange dots, or where it's less likely to be for that species. And the white dots are where I haven't filled anything in. 
So the true fescue is the hair grasses and the soft grasses at the top there on the left under most likely all have four blue dots and one orange dot. So four of the statements that I've put in uh, are true from, for those species. Now at the bottom of the least likely list, the vernal grasses and the meadow grasses, the false brains and the rye grasses, there's actually four orange dots. So four of the things that I've input disagree with those grasses and only one blue one. So this system, it's kind of used a mathematical approach. That's what Bayesian, um, Bayesian statistics, that, that um, sometimes you might see a Bayesian multi-axis key. It's just using a mathematical statistical approach to decide um, the probabilities. So this um, particular multi-axis key has decided it least probable that it be those grasses from the information I've put in. But I could go back in, I could change any of those and see what happens. Uh, and that might just change or narrow down the species in a different way. So two different approaches. There's the very methodical one after the other after the other single access key or a multi access key that allows you to change the order up a little bit uh, and then narrows things down in that way. So I've talked through quite a few limitations and um, just make sure I've covered any, everything. Um, usually keys are limited to one group of organisms and it might only cover common species. So we came a cropper with our leaf very early on um, because we only had nine leaves on the key. Uh, and obviously there are many, many more um, tree species uh, just in the UK um, that it could have been. So be aware of what um, version of a key and how many species it might be covering. There might be a geographic restriction. Your book might cover the UK, it might cover only England, it might cover Britain, Europe, um, and it might not cover migrating species. So if you've got an older guide, it might not um, kind of include species that perhaps have arrived relatively recently in this country, or perhaps have migrated further north um, due to the impacts of climate change. So just bear that in mind as well. I did say the use of technical terms can be a bit off-putting, and even for me, some of the keys, I have to look up the glossary, what, what do they mean by that, that term specifically? So um, try not to let it put you off. Um, I won't be going into detail about what every term means today, because I think we want to get an overview of keys. But as I said, um, going through, as we start to go into more detail of different species over the next few years, if we're out in the field and we're looking at one species group, perhaps we can look at some of the more technical terms in more detail. And with those technical terms, sometimes you can't see it from a photograph. You might have to have the, the specimen in hand. You might need a microscope or a hand lens. Uh, you might need to look at different angles of things, a different part of an insect, for example. Um, so that can be a bit tricky. It's hard to give a, um, even with a key, you can't always give an accurate identification just from a photograph. I think we've said the single access key relies on each characteristic being correctly identified in turn. So you need to start at the beginning. It's not always easy to backtrack if you think you've gone down the wrong path, you might have to go back and start again. And you might not get all the way to species level, you might only get to the family or genus. And that will just depend on um, the characteristics and what level of expertise you have in, in determining the characteristics. Hopefully you can get closer um, by using a key to what the um, species is than if you were just trying to look through a book. And it does require patience. Um, so, but hopefully worthwhile uh, and say so quite rewarding when we get to the end. Yes, I managed to key that out. Uh, we started for, um, at the start and I managed to work out what the species is. So we're going to have a section now, which is most of the presentation, uh, and look at some of the field guides that are available uh, and look at some of the keys within them and how they work, because there are subtle differences. Um, there are subtle differences, not just that most of them are single access and some of them are polycotomous, some of them are dichotomous, some of them are a mixture of both, um, depending on the number of statements you're looking for. But the way they're laid out is quite different. Uh, and that is something that you need to get the hang of, depending on what guide or what key you find yourself most comfortable with. So that might be getting hold of a few and having a play with a few until you come up with the ones you're most comfortable with. But for, day I want, for today, I want to take you through a few and hopefully you'll have an understanding um, of the different sorts of ones so that when you first open up a book and start to read about the key, you get, you've get you got an idea, okay, I think I can work out where I need to go with this. So I thought we'd start with Francis Rose's Wildflower Key. Uh, and this just has always been my go-to botany guide. Um, it's not necessarily the best or most comprehensive or the easiest to work with, but it's the one that I'm just most familiar with. And within this, you start with the general key to plant families. You start with this master key uh, and it takes you through some questions and then it will take you on to more keys as you go through. So this is the first key. 
um, but it's three or four keys until you actually get to the pictures uh, and the detailed descriptions of each flower. The thing about roses, it can be quite tricky to determine which of the two or more statements that you're looking for. Uh, and if you've got really sharp eyesight, you might just be able to see a couple of little pencil marks after the one there. Let me just pop a couple of arrows in to highlight. Um, I've actually annotated my book and this is a scan of my book um, and scribbled on it. So if you do have your own copy of a book, um, that can be a really good way to help you early on. Is to draw on it or put, use colours um, to help you make sure you're going down the right path. So this first statement, this single axis, this is the axis point, is number one. And there are two statements there. And the first statement is plants without flowers, so in rows, FLS just stands for flowers, or submerged aquatic plants with minute, inconspicuous flowers. And if the specimen you've got hasn't got flowers or it's a submerged aquatic plant with minute, inconspicuous flowers, you would then look at the vegetative keys on page 47. So the next option in this key is always on the right hand side. But if that doesn't meet um, your specimen, uh, your specimen has flowers, so plants with flowers present, in that instance, you go on to number two. Uh, so it is a methodical, straightforward approach, just making sure with this particular key that you can select, you can see the pairs of questions. So what I thought was we'd actually take a specimen, another flower that probably most of you are familiar with, um, and actually work it through, see if we can get through the book and actually get to this, um, get to what we believe this flower to be. Um, I picked this one just because I, I think maybe it was a bit of a miserable, miserable day and I was looking forward to spring already. Um, but I thought we'd take this through and see how, see how we go. So we started off with number one, um, and this plant has got flowers present. So we'll go with that uh, and we'll go on down, down to number two. So number two asks, is the plants with the individual flowers or florets very small? So it's put in bold in this book, the really key features, so very small flowers, and then grouped together in very dense heads. Um, so is it individual flowers or florets very small, grouped together in very dense heads, like a dandelion it even says there? Or is it plants with the individual flowers of varied size, but each flower possessing a separate and clearly visible, sometimes very short flower stalk of its own? So once you've read through all that, get your head around, okay, what's it asking here? So it's asking, is it sort of a dandelion-like flower with that really kind of grouped together florets? Or is it a plant with an individual flower on a stalk? And I think, and hopefully you'll agree, uh, that this one is the latter. And so therefore we're gonna go down to number five. So we've dropped down the page, we're ignoring three and four, because that's not relevant to us now. We're going down to number five. And again, there's two statements. And this one, I have to say, almost tripped me up when I was going through getting this presentation together. So um, I'll work you through it and let you know why I nearly got tripped up by it as well. So the two statements, the first one is individual flowers small, grouped into umbels, in which the several flower stalks all radiate from one point, like the ribs of an umbrella. On the tip of the stem, the umbels may be simple or compound. The other statement is individual flowers of varied size, either solitary on the tip of a stem or grouped into branch inflorescences of various forms and shapes. And here's the key bit, but never with all flower stalks radiating from one point as in an umbel. So I thought to myself, well, I know about umbels and umbellifers, uh, and I think of those as being more like a cow parsley or a wild carrot, and this, uh, this doesn't look like that, so surely it must be the second option. But then I reread it and reread the second option that says, but never with all flower stalks radiating from one point. Uh, and the little drawing down there, this particular plant, if you were looking at it, you'd notice that actually all the flower stalks do radiate from one point. So therefore, of these two options, I had to choose the first one, because actually all the flower stalks do radiate from one point, even though it's not a traditional umbellifer type plant that I would think of. Um, but maybe that's me knowing a little bit too much um, and kind of second guessing. Um, but working through those statements, <coughs> excuse me, um, we're gonna go with the first one, and we're going on to a letter now, and that's letter E, and that means um, we're going on to a new key. So the next key has kind of narrowed it down to the next step. The next step. And again, we've got um, a set of questions, one, two, three, four. And again, we start at one, and we've got a pair of statements. Is it a shrub or a woody climber, or is it a herb? And in this instance, it's not a woody kind of species, it's not a shrub at all, so it's a herb. And that means we go to number three. So number three, we've got two options, leaves parallel veined or leaves net veined. Parallel veined, it just means they're going along in lines parallel to each other and net veined. 
like it suggests. The veins are more like a net, like a mesh, and hopefully you can see on the leaf at the bottom there in the picture, they are net veined. So in this instance, we pick that one and we're going to number four. Number four essentially says, are the leaves all in a basal rosette? So are the leaves all coming out from basically ground level in like a rosette, like a ring? Or are the leaves not all in the basal rosette with some up the stem? Uh, and in this instance, they're all in a basal rosette. So hopefully you can see we're starting to narrow down, we're not all in a basal rosette. That's not the one we want, we want this one, which is the primula say. And this tells us to turn to page 231 in primula. So that's what we do, we turn to page 231 and we're faced with yet another key, we're still not there. So um, I hope you're still with me, um, but let's work through this next, uh, this next key and we're getting closer. So again, we start from number one and it says leaves all basal or stem leaves present. And we've already established the leaves are all basal, so we're going for number two. Number two asks corolla lobes, oh, I'm not sure what that is. Essentially, it just means the flower, um, but there's probably a technical um, description for it. But so the flower lobes, are they spreading the petals? Are they spreading or turned inwards? Or are they strongly bent back? And I don't think they're strongly bent back. Bent back, I'd have them as being um, fairly well spreading. So I would go with the first there. Uh, and this is just um, confirming that we're at Primula, uh, page 2312. Now this is quite small. I know you, I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, but this is just in pages 231, it's where you get a bit, little bit on the left and then the meat and drink is on page 232 and 233. And finally, we've made it to the actual pictures. Hopefully on the right-hand side, you can see A, B and C there, at least they're starting to look right. We've got the right sort of flowers, they're yellow, and we've got the right sort of leaves. Uh, and so what we can do is read through now all of these letters, A, B, C, D, E, etc. Any of them that are um, primula is what the key was suggesting. So we look in detail at those. If I zoom in on A, um, the primrose, uh, I'm not going to read through all of that because there's lots of uh, quite technical terminology there. But it's a perennial herb, rosette of very wrinkled leaves. Um, you can start looking at um, the leaves. It says they're downy beneath, if you read into that. Um, it also talks about the stems being a little bit woolly. It talks about um, a lobe on the petal having a shallow notch. So all these things that when, when you read through and understand the detail um, of the description A, it's all matching with our specimen there. Uh, and it's very much, it's very clear that it's like a, it's one flower on each stalk. Whereas if you were looking at um, B or C, the calcium and the oxalate, they tend to have more than one flower on the stalk. So we can be fairly confident, I think, um, that we've gone through and keyed out a primrose um, by using rose, which I thought was quite appropriate. Okay, hopefully you're still here. Um, and now we're gonna move on to a few more. I won't go into quite the same detail, but I want to point out the different ways that keys are laid out. This one is in Chinnery's Insects of Britain and Western Europe. And if you read the description um, underneath where it says the key, you'll see um, this key is designed so that adult insects of all but a few aberrant species can be assigned to their correct group. And the key bit for me here, is adult insects. So um, this is specifying that you need an adult life stage of an insect to work through this key. So that's something else to bear in mind in terms of what key you've got. Um, is the key covering the life stage or the time of year um, of the specimen that you're identifying? Um, so really worth uh, thinking about that. Uh, and we'll see another example of one that's a specific life stage of an insect in a moment. But this one here um, is, Again, you start at number one, it's a single access key, um, but at the moment you can't actually see the pair, the paired question. So number one is there, insect with wings, um, but you would have to look over the page to find its pair. But assuming your insect did have wings, you would then move down to number two. So if you're saying yes, um, you move down to the next number or the next symbol. If you're saying no to the statement, you need to find the pair and see if that's more appropriate. So for this one, uh, insects with wings, all wings membranous, then you're down to, is it one or two pairs of wings? And so here, finally, you do get the two options on the same page, but assuming you've got one pair of wings, you've then got five different options that will take you through to the next key, to ground hoppers, to mayflies, scaled insects, stylopids, or true flies. So you're taking it down in a step-by-step -step approach. But if you select no to any of them, for example, if you didn't have wings on yours, it would take you to a new page. So there's the other one 
which was over the page, and that's insects without wings or with just very small flaps. So sometimes you're going to need to turn the page and find the pair for your dichotomous key, or it might be three or four different ones for a polycotomous key. I mentioned about different life stages. In, in the field guide to the dragonflies and damselflies of Great Britain Island, there's amazing illustrations of adult dragon and damselflies. Brilliant, lots of description. And if you've got an adult in hand, um, you can really study it closely. Um, you can go through uh, and identify what you've got. But it does have also dragonfly larvae key in here. Um, it, it, it acknowledges that the identification, identification of dragonfly larvae is much more difficult than the identification of adults. Um, but again, it takes you through a key. Um, it's similar to rows in that you've got pairs, um, paired statements, um, and they're together, um, so they're not separate. Um, but actually, you can almost see a slight separation between the two, um, which may help you to see that there are two questions um, here. So, for example, under number one, larvae with three leaf like caudal appendages to the abdomen, or larvae with no caudal lamellae, but instead with five short spines at the tip of the abdomen. Helpfully, it's got one A and one B. And you can see the little diagram, so it's helped you with a bit of a picture as well. So it's added a picture onto the um, onto the text to help you identify: Are you going with um, the first or the second option? <clears throat> and therefore, you're either going down to number two or number seventeen. So you know, you're skipping through quite a lot of um, statements to get to seventeen if you've taken the second option. <coughs> Excuse me a moment. Okay, so now we're on to grasses, which can strike fear into the heart of many a botanist or many a species recorder. Um, this is one book, there are, there are lots of different guides and lots of different keys to grasses, but I just thought I'd take you through this one um, because it's a really good uh, example of an indented key. And it's an example of one where you've got to look over different pages, quite a few pages in some uh, cases, um, to get to the pair. So you're starting at number one. So there's a theme here with most of these books, you do start at number one. Um, assuming you are um, happy with that statement, you then move to the next number, number two. And assuming you are happy with that statement, you've moved to the next number three. And you can see that by the time we get to three, actually the pair is on the same page. And in this case, the pair is prefixed with an A. So suffixed with an A. And um, so you've got three and three A, that's your pair that you're looking for. But assuming the first answer is correct, from three, you then get down to four, and so on and so on. Um, so what you will find with this particular book is at the end of one and two, it actually gave you the page to turn to if that was not the case. So either um, one is on this page 35, one A um, is actually over on page 39. Two is also on page 35, but if you're looking for two A, you need to turn to page 36 to find the, the pair. Um, so keep looking backwards and forwards. You could use colour pens or pencils to help you, certainly with these early stage keys, um, to help you narrow down your choices as you're starting out. Um, the indented part, you can see as you move down, um, it's just the way that the text is indented into the page um, to help you kind of see, but you need to almost draw a line, and I have done it in my books, get a pencil and a ruler, and I've drawn a line so I can see where the indents are, where those pairs are, and that will become apparent in a, in, a, in a moment when we look at another couple of different keys. So this is one of those um, that's a relatively new key, and it's very, very popular, um, but it does take some work to get used to. Um, there is a big introduction that you really do need to read, uh, and people do have like training courses just to be able to use this book. If we're interested, we might be able to explore that, um, perhaps um, in one of our future sessions. But this is Poland and Clement's Vegetative Key to the British Flora. Um, this is actually the first edition. I think there was a second edition out um, <coughs> with a few subtle differences, but the layout is largely the same. So we're starting again with the key to major division. So this is the, almost like the pre-key. This is where your starting point is. And this is a really popular book because you don't need a flower. Um, so you can identify pretty much any plant um, just by its vegetative characteristics, so its leaves and branches and things like that. You don't need it to be in flower at the time. So that's a real plus point for this one. But for Poland, you start the major divisions by looking at the little um, black, um, black squares, so it's not numbered at all. Um, here, so you're looking at the black squares, horse tail, fern, club moss, conifer, or a flowering plant. So you need to have a bit of knowledge and have read the introduction to help you to decide um, 
which one of those five you're looking at to start with. For any of the first four, if you look along to the right, you're then moving to key A, key B, key C or key D. However, if you have a flowering plant, there's nothing along to the right there and we move down to the next set of um, statements. So if you've got a flowering plant, um, you go down to are the leaves absent or are the leaves present? And if the leaves are absent, it gives you the link to key E. So you turn the page if you find the key that is relevant to E. If the leaves are present, um, <coughs> you step down, indented, another one. So next up, so we've got flowering plant, leaves present. So plants with submerged or floating leaves or plants with aerial or emergent leaves. So are you in water or are you on the land? That's what it's essentially saying. Sometimes you need to take a step back and go, well, what is that actually telling me? Um, so submerged or floating leaves, ah, I get it. Is it in water um, or is it um, aerial or emergent leaves? And in brackets there, it's usually land plant, which is helpful. So if it's in the water, you go to F. If not, you carry on down this key. Now it becomes a bit more complicated because the two pairs, hopefully you can spot that the two yellow dots are a bit further apart. And this again is where your ruler and your colour pens come in really handy. So here you're now asked, is the leaves simple or are the leaves compound? Assuming the leaves are simple, you then come down and you're, now you've got three choices. So again, it's worth knowing how many choices you got as you go down, because it's not just two in this book. So this is a mixture of dichotomous and polycotonous um, uh, statements. So now the leaf margin is entire or toothed or lobed. Assuming it's entire, we can then go down to, is it parallel or pinnate veined? The next level down there, if it's parallel veined, is about the ligule and the oracles, are they present or absent? And then finally, um, looking in detail at the ligule will then take you on to G, H or I. Um, so you then turn the next page, get to that next key, and you kind of start the process again, but it will keep taking you through either to more lettered keys or eventually you'll start to get down um, to species level. So that's Poland and Clements, the vegetative key to the British flora. Poland's also written something in a very similar style, which is the field key to winter twigs. Uh, and this is um, one that I'm hoping that we're going to explore in our next session in December, which will be all about winter tree ID. So I thought it'd be really good to introduce it very briefly here. The good thing about this book is in the introduction, it says the key works best between the 15th of November and the 31st of March. So it gives you a time frame where this, this book works. And I guess the key is the, the hint is in the title because it's winter twigs, so in the winter. Tells you about ideally collecting an entire first year twig, but it encourages you to examine the crown shape, the bark, and the characteristics of branchlets. It also says the first time the user should read the introduction before proceeding with the key. So, if all else goes, do read the instructions, do take the time to read the front of the book and familiarise yourself with how it works uh, and the glossary because um, there may be some unusual terms in there that you're not familiar with. So for this example um, I'm going to assume we've got a twig in front of us that looks a bit like that that one on the cover there that I've just circled. Um, so the three options again it's the little black squares for Poland. Um, are the buds and leaf scars alternate? That's what ALT stands for. Are they opposite or are they world? So you've got three options and I think they're alternate they are going Kind of alternating up the stem and um, so we'll go on to A and then when you get to A we've got another key which is more similar now um, to the vegetative key again you start with the little black squares and it asks if the twigs are armed with prickles or if they're unarmed so essentially is your species a prickly bitey one or is it one that's not going to uh, snag your clothes if you try and brush, brush past it so assuming the second of those um, it then goes down to the next level of indentation. Is it a climber or is it a tree or shrub? If it's a tree or shrub, it gives you three options to do with the buds. If you choose are the buds single, then it asks about um, the scales on the buds. So each of these, basically, if you're selecting kind of the bottom option, you're either going along uh, and in some more. So in this instance, if the bud is four or more scales, you're going down to the twig level. If the twigs are green, you'd go on to AJ on the right hand side there. You can see it takes you to the key, but if the twigs are not green, you then have to go another level and look at stipule scars. If your stipule scars are present on twigs, that's the first option. It takes you down a final level um, looking at lateral buds. But eventually, if you work through this, you'll get to a double letter and that double letter will take you on to the next key. 
again, I've used the colours and the dots, and triangles and the lines to try and help you uh, hopefully see where the indentations are. Uh, if you've got your own copy, it may well be worth starting to annotate so that you um, certainly have to get familiar with it um, to get you kind of through to the right level. So that's a really good one. So we'll hopefully explore that one and potentially a few others in a bit more detail next month. That's a bit daunting, uh, and I quite understand that it was very daunting to me before I, uh, kind of before I kind of got into the detail of it. I started off with the Collins Tree Guide. I think most people will think, oh, I'll go to Collins as, as an identification guide. In there, um, the way that they do winter shoots in the Tree Guide here um, is similar. You're looking at other buds opposite, as in this case, or there's another page where the buds are alternate or um, in whirls. But it gives you a bit of a picture, uh, and it gives you um, just a bit of an idea um, so you can kind of see, actually, yeah, I think that looks like I've got black buds. I think that's an ash. Um, so off you go to page 436 um, and look in a bit more detail at it. So um, there might be some ones that feel a little bit easier to get into, um, but uh, it's a case of having a go, um, seeing how you get on with different, uh, different guides, different, um, different keys, um, but they will all potentially be slightly different. There's one um, actual multi-access key that is a paper copy of something that you might come across that I wanted to have a little look at. Uh, and that is the Field Studies Council guide. This one is the Common Grasses guide. Uh, and you may remember um, when I started uh, the presentation, I talked about multi-access keys often as being in a table format. So hopefully you can see that this is laid out more like that. It's not a series of questions. You've got everything laid out in one go. We'll zoom in a little bit. So this one has columns and rows uh, and the different symbols where the column and row collide um, kind of mean different things. So if you've got a red square, it means, yes, that feature is part of that species. Um, if you've got a black circle with a dot, it means it's usually not, but could be. Um, a green circle is no, so you really wouldn't see that on that species. Uh, and a little purple asterisk means it's inapplicable, it's just not applicable to that species. So. If you have a species where the flower head looks like A, the florette is D, the orns are F, the spikelets are I, the ligules are L, the leaves are O, and the growth form is Q. If you meet all of those, you've probably got false brome. But if you look down to the next species, the next line down is having ryegrass, actually the first four are all the same, and it's only when you get to ligules and leaves that you see that that's different. Um, but so you might need to look at different features, but it, you don't have to look at every feature. Um, you can start to look at um, the ones that you can see or the characteristics that you recognise. But this has grouped everything together. For example, all the florets that look like D are all grouped together. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so it's a way of kind of comparing different species by looking at a fairly simple sort of kind of set of columns and you can start to narrow it down. Now I'm hoping that we can um, make this work um, with some online identification keys that I wanted to show you. This means I'll have to flip backwards and forwards on my screens. So hopefully um, I'll be able to get this sorted out, but just bear with me while I make the technology work. And the first key I wanted to show you um, is this one from the RSPB, just a really relatively common um, one that will um, help you with um, uh, birds. And let me see if I can get the bird screen up. Um, I'm not sure if I'm doing that right or not. So let me just, um, so if just go back to that. And get onto the right one. Uh, apologies, I I hope this was going to be smoother and it's not quite as smooth as I wanted it to be, but I'm hoping, there we go, that's the one I want on the actual website. So I'm hoping um, that you can see um, that website. Um, maybe just pop, can you just pop a note in the, stick a thumbs up in the chat for me um, and just make sure, can you see that's the RSPB website, identify a bird. Anybody can type yes into the chat. Mm. Oh, brilliant, thanks Richard, awesome. Okay, brilliant. So RSPB, identify a bird. This is quite a, a simple, straightforward one, but it starts with um, 407 species of bird found in the UK. Um, and it gives you a list of things that you could um, you could put in uh, to help narrow that down. So I was out yesterday um, and I was on my local canal, so I was near or in fresh water. Thankfully, it wasn't, I wasn't in it, the bird was near or in it. Um, 
How big was the bird? I saw something that was between a robin and a blackbird size. So I can put that in. And what color were its feathers? You might get where I'm going with this. Um, I saw a real good flash of blue feathers here. So straight away with three clicks, this has taken me from 407 species of bird down to four. Uh, and you were probably well ahead of the game there and um, that it was a kingfisher that I saw on the canal. Hopefully that just illustrates that with a few clicks, actually you can narrow things down quite easily on an online key. Now, if I clear all the filters, um, I don't have to start at the top. So I was out on a walk last weekend and I spotted a bird that was actually hopping along the ground. Uh, and the main feature that, I, that came across to me was that it had a long beak, it's hopping on the ground with a long beak. So within two clicks, didn't have to start at the top of the list, started in the middle, it's given me some options there. And I can see, oh, do you know what? It was a juvenile green woodpecker. I wasn't sure because it looked a bit strange. Um, but yeah, that's what it was. It was hopping on the ground and had a long beak. Hopefully you can see from that really quite straightforward. So that is a key. It's a multi-access key. because You can start anywhere you like. Uh, and it helps you to narrow down your species uh, with a list of questions. You don't have to answer all of them, but the more you answer, hopefully, the more it will um, it will narrow down what your uh, your possible option is. So if I can get back to this one, so that was the RSPB uh, one. Now another great resource that I'll send around the link to this afterwards is iSpot, and on iSpot you've got a list um, of different identification keys. Uh, and there's a couple I'd like to take you through. Um, but firstly, I just want to have a look at this photo and see if we can memorise a few things that will help us when we go through the key. So it, it is a ladybird. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, I've got that right. Um, but its colour is red orange. Um, it has black spots with eight on each side. The legs, I think, are brown. And over winter, I've seen it inside the house. Um, here it's on a leaf, maybe a shrub or something, um, but I've seen it inside the house and I want to know what it is. So hold that in your mind uh, and let's see if we can um, go to uh, the website. So I think that's, uh, I think that would have worked. So we're on the iSpot website now and we're going to select the ladybird key. And with these keys, the first thing it asks you is if you want to um, narrow it down by species distribution and abundance in terms of location. So you could, if you knew you're in the north or in the south, um, narrow it down by your location as to what it is more likely to be. But also you can say no. The bottom answer here is treat all species equally. You can just say no. Assume all species are given equal weight. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to click next. And what I've got down here is a series of characters that are available to me. Um, I don't have to start at the top. Um, I don't have to put them all in. Um, it gives me some more information for each characteristic, uh, and then it also gives me the most likely species. So think back to that um, photograph. The first thing we said was the basic colour was red orange. So we're going to select that, see what happens. Okay. Uh, and then what else did I say? I said number of spots. Uh, we were able to count eight on each side. So I make that 16 or more. So we can select that. So we're getting somewhere now. Um, I said the photograph was of it on a leaf, so the habitat was on a, a shrub or on a hedgerow. So I can click that one. And then I said it was overwintering in my house. And so we can select that one. And hopefully you can see now along the side here, it's starting to put some ticks on the things it really thinks um, it most likely is going to be. And then the last one I'm going to put in is the leg colour, which were brown. I'm going to select that. So I haven't put in the size, the pattern type, food, the pronotum colour. I'm not sure what a pronotum is, so therefore I don't need to in this instance. Um, so it's helpful. If you don't know what something is, you don't have to select it. I could also put in the spot colour, um, which spots were black on our picture, so we can put that in. Hopefully, as you can see on the side here, um, the most likely one is the harlequin, and I can click on that. Uh, and I've now got some other images of it. Uh, and I can be fairly confident if I can come back to the presentation. Let's see if we can. Um, oh, I'll show you. There we go. Come back to the presentation. Uh, and that's pretty much what we've got is a hard for neighbor there. 
So one more online key before we move to these kind of questions and answer session. Uh, so I think we're doing okay in terms of time. Now I must profess to knowing very little about lichens, nothing at all. But I trundled out into the garden um, and found a branch of a, an apple tree um, that had some lichen on it. I hope that looks interesting. Popped it under a, a little uh, microscope and so I could take a closer look. And I thought, I wonder if we can work out what lichen this might be. So here's another thing to remember. So grey above and below, so the greyish colour. It's not firmly attached to the tree, but they're sort of the leaf, it's sort of leaf-like, but it's sort of spreading along the branch a little bit. It's quite a uniform colour. So try and hold that picture in your mind. Uh, and we're going to go to the simple lichen key again on the iSpot website. So I'm going to go back to the iSpot website. And I'm going to go back to the list of keys. Uh, and I'm going to go for well, lichens found on trees. There was some other here. There was crustose lichens on trees. Now, I'm not sure what a crustose lichen is. And I'm not really sure what a folios lichen is. So lichens found on trees, that sounds, oh, look, I think that one is for beginners. Um, so hopefully that's the one for me. I don't know a lot about lichens, but let's see if we can um, find out what we're, um, what we're up against. It could give weight, extra weight to common species. So it could be more likely to show me common species. Am I in a relatively common habitat? So I could select that. Um, I was in my garden, so probably. Um, but as with the ladybirds, let's go no. Let's say we'll treat all species equally and what, uh, see what comes up. So we've got a selection of characters less on this one, which is possibly helpful. Um, so let's start with colour. Um, so the colour of the lichen, um, think back, I think it was grey green. I don't think it was apple green. Um, there was a bit of yellow, but I think that might have been a separate something. So let's stick with the grey green for this, this one. Um, the lower surface of the lichen. Oh, now I'm not sure about that. I might leave that one till later. Um, what else? The attachment. So was it really like, attached, like really branch-like, or was it leaf-like lobes? And I think it was kind of leaf-like lobes. And they were sort of spreading out. There were some sticking out bits, but it was kind of spreading out. I'm going to select that one. Um, and then I'm going to say, what was the cross section like? Um, now I spent some more time examining it under the microscope, and I think the lobes that the, the, um, the lobes of the lichen were quite thin and leaf-like, and they weren't, they didn't look swollen at all to me. So I'm going to pop that in. Uh, and then finally, um, let's have a look at the surface pattern. Uh, and it was quite plain. There were no spots or lines. Here we go. We're getting there. Um, so it's narrowed down on the right to one it really thinks it is. Let's have a go at filling in the last one, which is the lower surface colour. Um, it looked quite white underneath to me. It looked quite pale. So let's go with that. Um, so we filled in all of them in this instance, and it's come up with this one called Pissia. If I click on that, it shows me um, what it thinks, tells me a little bit about it. And I can see now it's got these little sort of tendrils at the end. So let's just whiz back to the presentation and see if we can come up with that. And we go, oh, actually, do you know what? I think I can see some little tendrils on the end there. So I think that Piscia was right. Um, I think that's what we've got here. I could look that up and uh, go away uh, and do a bit more investigation. This yellow bit of lichen, I could maybe run that through the key separately and see if that is different. That was my instinct was that it was different or was it the same part of lichen? Um, so I've taken through, I've picked some characteristics and had a go. I could always go back and change any of them if it didn't seem to come out as the right thing. Maybe I picked the wrong, you know, the, the wrong suggestion. Um, but that's kind of generally um, taking me through and giving me a really good starting point on that online key. Okay. So hopefully you're still with me. We've got five minutes left, so we can have a bit of a Q&A if there is any, make sure that um, uh, we've covered everything. So as before, just a reminder, the resources are all on the website. Um, the previous record, uh, recordings, all the training sessions, you can link from there, or if you go onto the Leicestershire Rutt and Wildlife Trust YouTube page, they're all on there. The spotter sheets are on there um, from previous sessions. I haven't done one for this one. I didn't think it was as relevant because we've done quite a lot of different things rather than focusing on a species. Um, but you can download all the rest of them there. You're always willing to, um, welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, let me know um, if you've got any questions, comments, uh, where you might like to see things going. We're going to start to plan next year's activities, hopefully get some field-based sessions going on. 
we will do Q&A. I just wanted to finally say to you on this part of it, um, so winter tree identification next session, uh, Wednesday the 15th of December, I will send around the booking link. Um, so book on and um, hope to see you there um, for that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and come back uh, and say hello to anybody I've got on here. Uh, just double check the chat. Thank you for your yeses. <laughs> Let me know and I could, uh, you could see me. So that's brilliant. Um, so has anybody got any questions about any of that? Just going to scroll along. Sue, Sue, you've got your hand up there. Um, so I unmute you. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm, uh, are you able to un unmute and ask your question, Sue? Sorry. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, it was just to say thank you for um, your presentation. It was um, wonderfully clear and um, concise, and uh, really appreciated that uh, as a as a nice uh, a nice summary of uh, introduction to to keys. So thank you very much. Um, Brilliant. The other, thank you. The other thing was um, whether you could recommend a good key. This is a hard one for fungi. <laughs> the fungi. Uh, yeah. You'll notice on purpose I've steered clear of fungi. Um, I, I can't specifically, um, but I do have a colleague who might be able to. Um, so let me make a note uh, and I will put it, if I can find one or get again an answer to your question there, I will send that round with the email um, uh, and see if we can answer, uh, see if we can answer that. I've got um, a big book of fungi, but I don't think it's got a key in it. Um, but uh, I can't remember. Let me just have a little look um, on iSpot whether there is a fungi one. Um, no, I can't see one that's fungi there. Um, so um, I will look. At, I will look into it for you. See, see if I can come up with anything. But um, thanks ever so much for your feedback. I, I'm just, it's really great to hear because I can't always see what's going on um, with the powers of Zoom. Um, but no, I'm glad that that was that was clear and, and people could see it uh, and follow through. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have I got anybody else? Um, just trying to see if anybody else is waving at me or putting their hand up. Last chance saloon. It uh, sounds as though uh, we're bamboozled everybody or you're all off to either get your lunch or get your post-lunch cuppa. So um, thanks very much for joining. Um, thank you very much for staying with us. Um, thank you, Mike has just popped in a link to the British Mycology Society that has some um, online keys. Um, I will pop a note down um, um, to send that round as part of the link as well. Um, so great to see you all. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll finish it here. Uh, and have a great uh, rest of the day and rest of the week. Great to see you all. Thank you.